Raiders are working well. I don't know about yours. What? Right. is good today. Good morning. It's good to see you today. My name is Stephen Watson. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're visiting with us, we're so glad you're here. We would so appreciate it. If you would, uh, if you've not been given a visitor card already, there should be some in your seats. If you just pick one of those up, fill it out, and drop it in the offering box, which is in the back corner over there. I um, also want to let you know about a few different things. Uh, one, one of them is we're in a new facility, and so we're still learning things. The bathrooms are straight through those doors and to your left. Also, we have a cafe beside the kitchen that has the streaming of our service on a TV in there. So if you need to step out for any reason, that's available to you as well. One of the things we need to talk about today is an event that's happening tonight called Carols at the Creek. This is the third time we've done it. It's our third annual Carols at the Creek. Uh, we do this at Purser Park. One of the things that we do as a church is we believe that outreach needs to be key, needs to be central. It's one of our values as a square. And so we're always going to be pushing ourselves out beyond our walls, out beyond our facility. Uh, we could say, well, we've got a facility. Let's do a Christmas Eve service or let's do a Christmas program at our church. Yeah, we could do that, but we'd much rather go to where the neighborhood is, where our community is, and invite to them to a neutral place where we can proclaim the gospel and sing praises to our King Jesus. So we're doing that tonight at 5.30. I'm so excited that it's kind of cold and feels Christmassy uh, and that we won't be wearing shorts tonight. So, so grab a jacket, grab some gloves, and come and have some hot chocolate. Uh, we do have areas for our, our regular attenders and our members to serve at this event. Uh, directly after this service, uh, Donald has brought his trailer, so we're going to be loading up chairs and different things on that trailer and then going across the street to set it up. That's going to be directly after this service. So if you're available to help out th with that, we'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, during the event, we have people serving hot chocolate, but we also always need a crew of people to help break things down as well. All right, Christ Community Church, let's go ahead and stand for our Advent call to worship. We're doing call and response through Advent, so I will read a passage and then you'll respond with the passage as well. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Christ Community Church, let's lift our voices and sing loudly to the King of Peace, our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, come, O oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appeared. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Come to the O Israel. 
is born, Christ the Savior is born. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face. With the dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, Our text for confession this morning comes from Psalm 34, verses 14 through 16. It says, turn away from evil and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil to remove all memory of them from the earth. I think often, church, we fall into this trap or this lie um, that the greatest evil in the universe is outside of our own hearts. And weekly, we remind one another that there is sin present in each and every one of us, but it is the Lord who brings peace to rebels. It is the Lord who um, sets um, his face and listens to their cry for help. It is the Lord also who judges justly those who would partake in evil. So Christ Community Church, we have some things to confess this morning. Ways we have not done what is good. Ways we have not sought the face of Christ or sought peace. Ways we have not pursued righteousness. And so wherever the Lord is convicting you this morning, spend the next few moments confessing silently to him.
The psalmist continues in verses 17 through 18 and says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears. And he rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted, and he saves those crushed in spirit. Heavenly Father, Lord, we cry out to you. We know that you are merciful, that you are gracious, that you abound in steadfast love for your children, Lord. And, and we confess to you that there are many things that we have done on a heart level that is actively against you, that is actively against peace. Lord, we long often for to be the center of the universe, to let everything be about us and we pursue those things lord but we confess that it provides no rescue no help to us and so we confess we ask your forgiveness from those things or corporately i ask these things lord and and we rest in the knowledge that when we cry out you hear that when we cry out you rescue and lord that you draw near to us when we are crushed in our spirit. Lord, crush our sinful spirits in us and let us walk in righteousness because of the work of the Son. We ask these things in your name and we all agree. Amen. Christ Community Church, when you confess your sins to God, you can be assured of the forgiveness you have in Jesus. Amen. And we celebrate that each week at the Lord's table as we... Um, remind one another of the union that we have with Christ. At Christ Community Church, whether you are a member here or not, if you believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and are actively trusting in Him, we'd invite you this morning to participate at the Lord's table with us. Um, but if you are a Christian who has professed a love for Jesus but Somehow your heart is not aligned with your words and you're walking in unrepentant sin with no true desire to turn from your sin and turn back to Christ this morning. I'd encourage you to refrain from taking the elements with us, that you would simply ask God to deal with your heart, that he would crush your spirit to save your life. Amen. That's a good prayer. And if you do not know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, just as we would never ask you to profess a love for a spouse that is not yours, we would also in turn not ask you to profess a love for a Savior you do not know. So please refrain from taking the elements as well. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the disciples to the upper room and they had the Passover meal. And Jesus, he took the bread, he blessed it and broke it, said, this is my body which has been broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, he raised it, said, this cup represents a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Later in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul tells us that as long as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim Christ until he comes again. Amen? Christ Community Church, let us celebrate this great union with Jesus that he has bled and broken his body for you and I. We are in a new facility. I forgot to say this. So if you're new here, welcome. Um, how we'll do communion is Pastor Stephen will be over here. I'll be over here. You'll stand up by row, come out towards the outside walls, come back in the center aisle back to your seat.
If you are a child, fourth grade or younger, go ahead and head out now. Your teachers are waiting for you outside. And the mass exodus commences. All right, good morning, Christ Community Church. <clears throat> you know, I got, I got one of the toughest scriptures, I think, that I've ever read. So I've listened to it a half a dozen times. I've read it half a dozen times, and I'll probably still chew it up, but bear with me, okay? Uh, our passage today comes from Matthew, the first Matthew 1 through 25, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Aram. Aram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashim. Nashim fathered Sol Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. Solomon fathered Rehoboam. Rehoboam fathered Abijah. Abijah fathered Asa. Asa fathered Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat father, fathered Jeram, or Joram. Joram fathered Uzziah. Uzziah fathered Jotham. Jotham fathered Ahaz. And Ahaz fathered Hezekiah. Hezekiah fathered Manasseh. Manasseh fathered Amon. Amon fathered Josiah. And Josiah fathered Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah fathered Shealtiel. Shealtiel fathered Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel fathered Abiud. Abiud fathered Eliakim. Eliakim fathered Azar. Azar fathered Zadok. Zadok fathered Achim. Achim fathered Eliad. Eliad fathered El Elazar. Elazar fathered Nathan. Nathan fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Christ. So all the generations of Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David until the exile to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the exile to Babylon until the Christ, 14 generations. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to make Mary as your wife, because what, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all took this place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See... The virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and then they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations until, until her, with her until she gave birth to a son and named him Jesus. That's Matthew 1 through 25. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Tommy. That, that is, I think, the hardest passage we've seen since we were like in 1 Samuel and reading genealogies there. Um, it's times like this that makes me very thankful that we have scripture readers, and I do not have to read it myself. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we get to gather together this morning to sing praises to you and to your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his coming into this world to bring us peace. We thank you that he has come to establish his kingdom. And I pray that as we read this word and as we expound it through sermon, that your Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts and our minds, transforming us into the image of Christ himself. And we pray this 
In Jesus' name, amen. I do have to admit, I love Christmas music. Before I was married, Lindsay and I had uh, this debate about when to start listening to Christmas music. Uh, I said you had to wait until Thanksgiving because you don't want to encroach on Thanksgiving with Christmas music. Very rational, very reasonable. Uh, She said, no, 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 you don't have to wait until Thanksgiving. You have to wait to the first cold snap. To which my argument is, we're in Texas. Like, you might not be able to listen to Christmas music at all. Um, but over the years, I, I've conceded that, that she is right, and I've become much more liberal in my Christmas music listening. Um, in fact, I think, it was before, I think it was before Halloween that my kids convinced me to pop Hanson Christmas in the radio on the way to school. Uh, one of my favorite songs, not sung by Hanson, is... Uh, is a song called I've Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Have y'all heard this? It's based off of a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And if you've not heard Casting Crowns sing this song, I encourage you after the service, pull it up on your phone, pull it up on your computer, and listening, listen to Casting Crowns sing this poem. This poem turned into a song, I've Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, was written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in the 1860s. Uh, He wrote this song after his wife passed away, and he was left to raise six children on his own. His oldest son, during the same time frame, was actually fighting in the Civil War and was seriously injured uh, by a bullet wound in one of those battles. And it was in this context that Longfellow wrote this poem. The first few stanzas go along these lines. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet their words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Very positive, very hopeful, right? But then the second stanza goes this way, and in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth and goodwill to men. I think when we read that poem, we hear that song that we can, that we can somewhat relate. That as we read the headlines and as we look at the world around us today, we can say there is no peace on earth. That hate is strong, and that hate actually mocks the song that there will be peace on earth. But yet at the same time, as we read the birth narratives, there is this song that's ringing that there is peace on earth. So what we want to do this morning is we want to look at Matthew chapter 1 and talk about peace on earth. We want to answer three different questions. We want to answer the question, who is this peace for? Where is this peace found? And how do we hold on to this peace? Let's begin answering the first question of who is this peace for? Matthew begins his gospel in a very unique way. He begins it with a genealogy where he traces Jesus' ancestors back for 42 generations. Most of us in here probably couldn't even name our great-grandparents, but Matthew goes back for 42 generations of Jesus' ancestry. We have to ask ourselves why. Why does Matthew begin his gospel speaking about about and tracing Jesus' genealogy back all the way to Abraham? And one of the purposes in doing this is Matthew is wanting to connect Jesus to the Old Testament. He's connecting Jesus to the promises found in the Old Testament. So if we look at this genealogy, we see in verse 2 that he traces everything back to Abraham, oftentimes called the father of our faith, whom God called out of a pagan land into a promised land and gave him great promises. The greatest of those promises he gave to Abraham is found in the book of Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 through 3. This is what God promised Abraham. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. 
I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Did you catch that? We ask the question, who is the peace of Christ for? And all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, we have the promise given to Abraham that God's blessing, God's promise of peace is for the entire world. That it is for all the peoples on earth. And as we continue through this genealogy, we see that that Matthew traces it not only to Abraham, but it also goes through this line of David. We see this in verse 6, where he talks about Jesse being the father of King David, an ancestor of Christ. And God promised King David, the greatest of the kings of Israel, he promised David this in 2 Samuel chapter 7, your house and your kingdom will endure before me forever. And your throne will be established forever. It was a promise to King David that his line, his descendants, will rule the world, not for a generation, not for 10 generations, not for 42 generations, but forever. It was a promise of Christ. In Isaiah in chapter 11, speaking about Jesse and David and the promise of Jesus to come, says this in Isaiah chapter 11. On that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will look to him for guidance, and his resting place will be glorious. Did you catch that again? The promise to Abraham was for all the nations, all the peoples of the world. The promise that God made to David through Isaiah was for the, the nations, and for all peoples to look to him for guidance. When we ask the question, who is the promise of peace for? The scriptures make it very clear that the promise of peace that God gives is for all peoples. But when Jesus' ministry began in the New Testament, we find that this was a very contested issue. That different Pharisees and different teachers of the law did not think that the promise of peace was for all people, but only for themselves. They thought that the Messiah was for them and against other people. That Jesus or the Messiah was supposed to come for the Jews, but not the Samaritans. That the Messiah was going to come to redeem Israel, but destroy Rome. That the Messiah was very specific for themselves. But this genealogy reminds us that Jesus came for all people. We see this in the different people listed in this genealogy. That oftentimes we think that we have to be perfect and righteous in order to come to God. And we look at who is in here and we think it is not a list of perfect and righteous people. Think about Abraham, the father of our faith lacked trust in God during a famine and fled to Egypt, and twice lied about his wife, saying that she was his sister and she was married off to other men. Look at Jacob, who was a deceiver, who lied to his father, cheated his brother, and ran away with, from his father-in-law. Look at Tamar, a Canaanite, an enemy of Israel. You can look at Rahab, who was a prostitute, Ruth, a Moabite, David, an adulterer, Jeconiah, who was cursed by God and was told that none of his descendants would ever rule again. It reminds us that the promise of peace is for all people, all nations, all tribes, all tongues, and that this promise of peace is for broken people. You don't have to be perfect and righteous to come to God. God knows that we are broken, knows that we lack peace, knows that our lives are in chaos, and it's at that point that God comes to us. Jesus put it this way in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, we are told the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to Jesus' disciples. 
And they asked the question, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus replied to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Do you see the hopefulness of this? That, that it takes being broken. It takes being separated from God. It takes being helpless in our lives and chaos for us to receive the promise of peace. So I want to encourage you, if you look at your life and you say, my life is broken right now. That, that things are not working out the way they're supposed to, and my life is full of, of, of sin and rebellion against God, it is almost as if God is saying, good, you recognize it. Because it takes recognizing your brokenness to come and to receive this peace of God in the first place. So my encouragement for you this morning is to come to Christ don't wait until your life is cleaned up. Don't wait until you have things together. Don't wait until you look respectable because we all know that doesn't describe any of us. But come to Christ as you are because His peace is for all people. Those of you who are in Christ, I would ask a different question. Do you leave room for other people to be a part of God's promise of peace? Because I think oftentimes we begin to think that to follow Christ, to be a part of His kingdom, to receive His peace, that people have to look like us. They have to have our standards and our way of life. But God's promise of peace is very unexpected. And I think that's what we see in this genealogy. People from every tribe, every tongue, people who were pagan, who were called to believe and I, I know it's my hope for this year that as we think about our ministry as a church, my hope for this year is that we will be surprised at who God calls to himself through the ministry of this body of Christ. That we see people that we would not expect to be Christian submit to Christ and to bow their knee to him. And that our church would, would be diversified in every way of seeing people come to Christ. But let us be careful not to think that everyone has to look and be like us in order to experience this peace of God. Because His peace is promised to all people. And we have to ask this next question. Of, well, if peace is promised to all people, where is this peace found and we see this in verses 18 through 25. That the answer is that peace is found in the presence of God. Look at what it says in verse 21 of chapter 1. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. True peace is only found when we find ourselves in the presence of God. Back in 1954, the Billy Graham uh, Evangelistic Society or Association was doing uh, a, a revival week or month, I don't know how long it was, but, but they were doing this back in London. And the association came together and they began to ask a question that when people are come forward saying, man, my life is broken and I, and I realize my sin and I realize my rebellion against God, like, what do we say to them? And how do we train our volunteers on how to engage with them? And so one, one, of, the, uh, one of the members of this association developed a, a tool that you might have heard of. It's called Steps to Peace with God. You ever heard of this before? Written back in 1954 to help walk people through the accepting of Christ to find peace in God. And this Steps to Peace with God begins with this first step that they would tell people 
And what they would tell people is this. God loves you. And he wants you to experience peace and eternal life. Because they realized that peace was only found in Christ. That Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the grave and he paid the penalty for our sins. Why? To bridge the gap between us and God. That that is the only way to find peace. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 states it this way. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The way that we find peace with God is by looking to Christ and trusting Him. Trusting that He is the Son of God. Trusting that He came into the world to save us through our sins. Trusting that he did this by dying on the cross and being raised again to new life. And trusting that he can give that new life to us. And we trust this. And because our trust is in this, we turn from our rebellious ways and we turn to following God. This is the foundation of our faith. It's not the way, it's not the only way that we come into our faith. It's not the way we we come into the faith this way, but we also, as Christians, this is the foundation that we have to go back to time and time again. I remember whenever I was, whenever I was a youth pastor, uh, I had this Google Drive for all my different ministries. I was youth pastor, I was was the associate pastor, and so, you know, ask Neil, associate pastors do uh, everything. And so, and so I was doing youth, I was doing small group, I was doing missions, I was doing the associate pastor work of like filling the pulpit, I was, I was doing meeting with members. It was that, that little phrase in the job description of like, as duties, as, you know, ex- yeah, y'all know, the, y'all know the phrase. Um, but I had this Google Drive for all my different ministries, and it was called Foundational Documents. And so like my youth foundational documents basically said this. Uh, it basically said, uh, what do I want the youth to look like after they've been in our ministry? And we called it our graduate profile, that if someone is in our ministry for two to four years, what knowledge should they obtain? What skills should they get experience in? And then, how are we going to accomplish those transfer of knowledge and skills to the students. And I call this my foundational documents because sometimes we get so wrapped up in life, and as a youth pastor, we get so wrapped up in ministry of saying, what fun thing are we going to do, and what's it going to look like? We forget what we're actually about. And so that foundational document was something that I have to refer back to all the time to remember who we are and what we're about. For our church, it's our church covenant. Always going back to that covenant that we've all agreed to live by. It's our foundation. Think of it this way. Nations, their foundational documents are their constitutions. It is is how they said this is foundational to what we believe and how we are going to live and operate as a nation in this world. How the government will engage with the citizens. And as a country or as a nation goes about their life in this world, they need to always go back to those foundational documents. For the Christian, our foundation for the promise of peace is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's something that we have to go back to time and time again to hold on to that peace. Which leads us to our final question of how do we hold on to this peace? Talking about peace in this way does lead to the big question that says, you know what? I believe in Jesus. I've trusted in Jesus. I followed Jesus. I tried to be faithful to Jesus. But when I think about my life, I find that my peace is fleeting at best and non-existent at worst. Have you ever felt that way? That we were promised peace with Christ, but it just seems to be fleeting. This was Longfellow's 
point in that second stanza, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, that, that hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth and goodwill to men, that I just don't have the peace. So how do we hold on to it? And I think we have to realize that our battle for peace is not a battle of flesh and blood, of bullets and blades, but our fight for peace is oftentimes against an internal enemy. Neil mentioned this in his prayer of confession, that oftentimes we think that the enemy is outside of us, and there is an enemy outside of us. But our greatest enemy that wars against our peace comes from within us. And the Scripture describes it with the word flesh. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. So if we ask ourselves, why is it that peace seems fleeting? Or why is that peace seems non-existent? And what Paul is saying to the church in Rome is this. Oftentimes the reason we're not experiencing peace in our own life is because oftentimes our mindset is on the flesh. And if we want to fight for peace, then our mindset needs to be on the spirit where there's life and peace. So let's talk about that just for a moment. As I was thinking about that this week, I said, well, what are some of the mindsets of the flesh? What are the thieves of our peace that try to take it away from us? And here's just three that I came up with. These are not all inclusive. There are other ones out there. But here are three thieves of peace in our lives. A mindset set on the flesh. Lies that we oftentimes believe. The first thief of peace is the thief of control. This idea and this mindset of the flesh that says, I am in control of my life. And we might not say that. But through how we manipulate our circumstances and handle our schedules and our relationships, what are we trying to do? We're trying to keep ourselves in the driver's seat. Trying to control ourselves and control our world around us. But here's the problem. When we do this and we live according to this lie, what we do is we are saying that my peace is dependent upon my own strength. But we are constantly reminded that we are not strong enough. Last winter, in February, we had the, the snowpocalypse, right? And it, was, it, was, it was cold for a couple weeks. And if you drive down my neighborhood, you'll see a lot of dead trees. And we had in our yard this 35 to 40-year-old Arizona ash tree. Arizona ash is like one step above hackberry. I hate those trees uh, because they're so weak and they die. And so I have this Arizona ash. This tree's trunk was about this big around. It was massive, and it died in a storm. And all year I've been looking at it, hoping it would come back to life because I didn't want to have to deal with it, but it just never came back to life. And so uh, I called someone to come and, and cut it down. And trying to be uh, smart and savvy, I said, hey, is it cheaper if you just leave the wood and I'll take care of the wood myself? They're like, oh yeah, we'll give you a deal. And so they cut the tree down and they left the wood. And when they were done, I went around the corner and I saw a lot of wood. Uh, more, it's going to take me a few years to burn through all this stuff. But anyways, I saw it and I thought, all right, well, time to get on it. So I bust out my chainsaw and we start cutting up the branches into the right size for firewood. And my yard has this big hill, so I'd put them in the wheelbarrow and walk it down the hill and stack it, or I have my kids stack it. And then I'd walk back up the hill. I was spent. And the last four pieces 
of wood was going to be too much for my little chainsaw because these last four pieces were the trunk. And each one was three to four feet long, and each one was this big around. But I thought, you know what? I'm in control here. I'm strong. I'm capable. I'm going to move these stumps where I want them in my yard. So what do I do? I get behind the roundest, smallest one, and I put my body weight behind it, and I push at it. And you know what happens? Nothing. So I said, all right, I'm strong, I'm capable. I get a better stance, and I get all my weight and all my strength behind it, and I begin to push it, and slowly that stump, that giant trunk of a log begins to roll. And in my mind, it's like, I just got to get it to the hill. Because once I get it to the hill, gravity is going to take over, I'm going to control the situation, and it's going to roll to the area that I want. And so I get it to the edge of the hill, and I stop, and I take a break, and I, and I like an expert golfer, begin to read the green. And I think if I angle the log this way, it should be able to like thread the needle between the swing set and my shed. And I get behind it, and I push it, and gravity begins to take over. And it takes a hard left turn and like smashes into my shed, which now I have a new project to do, right? (laughs) It's a parable of our lives that we look at our lives and we say, I am strong enough. I am capable enough. I can manipulate the situation and make things go the way I want them to go. But life, like a giant log, begins to take over and runs itself and creates chaos and ruin. Isaiah, the prophet, said this in Isaiah chapter 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard that the Lord, the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth, he has never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Youths may become faint and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not grow faint. There's a thief of peace that says, I am in control. But what the gospel says is to realize our weakness, to realize that we are powerless, and to trust And the one who is all-powerful, who gives us strength to run this race. The thief of peace is that fact that we say, I am in control. But peace is found in ceding control to God. The second thief of peace is the peace of acceptance. That we seek peace through the acceptance of other people. That we want to have this desire to achieve, to be affirmed, to be recognized. But what we do when we do this is we are putting our peace in someone's hands other than Jesus. And I think this peace, this, this peace thief, this idea of acceptance really comes in like an offense and a defensive way. So I think the offensive lie of acceptance is our desire to achieve, to be affirmed, to be recognized. Oftentimes this is found whenever we're at work. And we want those accolades. We want that promotion. We want to achieve, to be affirmed, to be recognized. But there's more of a defensive, there's more of a defensive desire for acceptance as well. And this is oftentimes found in jobs where you can't achieve a promotion or be affirmed or be recognized. And oftentimes in this world, it's a desire just for simple acknowledgement and validation to be seen. When I was talking with my wife, she said, oftentimes this, this is the type of, of acceptance that's found in the homemaker. That you are spending your days doing seemingly mundane things that other people might not value. And what you want is to be acknowledged and validated and be seen. It's an 
different form of acceptance. But what we need to do is to believe truth and not lie. Lies says that our values come from what other people think and say about us. But what truth says is that we are valued because we are accepted by God and we are made in his image. So peace is fleeting when we long for acceptance and validation by other people. And peace is found by resting in the truth that we are accepted in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thieves of peace. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says this about how to combat these thieves. For although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh, since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. How do we fight the thieves of peace? How do we fight things like control? How do we fight things like this idea of being accepted? How do we fight the ideas that, that I just want to distract myself? We do it by thinking. We do it because God has given us knowledge and truth in the Word of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we want to fight and hold on to the peace, then we have to be finding ourselves in this book. Because in this book, it is our tool, it is our weapon to demolish the arguments of our flesh that reminds us that we are not in control, that reminds us that we are accepted by God, that confronts the sins that we are putting our hopes in and our pleasures in. We need to find ourselves in this word. But finally, we also need to be in community as well. Think about it this way. One, one of the hard spots, one of the hard things about trying to align ourselves to the word of God, to see our sin, to see the, 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 uh, the thieves of peace that we're believing in, one of the hard things is that we have these blind spots that we don't see. And the nature of a blind spot is that we can't see it. We don't know about it. And so we continue to live life with this thief of peace because we don't see what we're doing. So how do we get to a point where we can see what we're doing and how we're living? The Scripture's answer is that the way that we do this is by being active in a community of faith, by being a part of the church. Hebrews chapter 10 says this, Let us hold on to the confession of our hope, that foundation, without wavering, since he who promised is faithful, and let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting together together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other as the more you see the day approaching. Do you see what the author of Hebrews is saying? That the way that we see the blind spots in our own life, the way that we can see sins that we don't see, is that we can be a part of a community of faith that says, I think you're trusting in control and not Christ. I think you're pursuing acceptance of the world and not acceptance by God. It's through the community of faith. And then we encourage one another to go back to our confession of Christ. We watch out for one another. I was at a Christmas party last week with some people from church. It was like a, the staff elders Christmas party. And we were going through just talking about this last year and all that God did this year. And I said, well, what about next year? And someone at that meeting, I think, said something prophetic. They said, you know, oftentimes whenever you have a group of people and they're all striving towards something, you'll see that there's great unity. But once they've achieved it, you see the unity begin to break apart. And we began to think about our journey as a church. Year one, we had this goal of, hey, we want to spread the mission of God to Harker Heights, and we really don't want to die as a church. <laughs> we want to be established. 
In year one, COVID hit, and then we had the opportunity to build this church house. And so the goal was, man, we really want to not only do our mission and be established, but we also want to get in this building. And then those things have been accomplished. And what this person, I think, was saying was now that those things have been accomplished, there's a danger that exists within our church. That because we don't have those driving forces, opportunities for disunity will begin to spring up, will begin to potentially reveal themselves. I think it was a prophetic word that we need to be careful about, that we need to protect the unity of the body of Christ so that we can encourage one another, help one another, and to maintain the peace of Christ in our hearts, in our minds, and in our life. Romans 14 Verses 19 through 20 says, So then, let us pursue what promotes peace and what builds up one another. Do not tear down God's work because of food, because of these secondary issues. So brothers and sisters, to fight for peace, let's go back to the foundation of Christ. Let us Let us hold truth to the Word of God and let us strive for unity within the body of Christ. That song that we started off with, I love it. It begins with, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. Wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then the darkness. And in despair, I bowed my head There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth and goodwill to men. But then he was holding on to his peace, holding on to the foundation. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth and goodwill to men. Christ Community Church, Christ Jesus our Lord is the foundation of our peace. So let us hold fast to Him. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank You for Your Word and for the peace that we have in Christ. I pray, Lord, that as we struggle with holding on to that peace, I pray, Lord, that when we feel like peace is out of our reach and non-existence, that rather than trying to muster up the strength and to live life on our own power, that we would go back to you who will give us the strength and to raise us on the wings of eagles. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to sing the doxology to end today. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son. Go ahead and remain standing. Don't forget, tonight at 5.30 is Carol's at the Creek. Uh, We look forward to seeing you there. One of the things I love about events like that is we get to be in one service together. It's hard being in two different services in the morning, so I look forward to these events where we all come together. Uh, Don't forget, if you have the availability, uh, Donald has already left to go get the trailer and bring it over here. Uh, We're going to be loading stuff over there to try and set up for that event. So if you have the availability, we'd appreciate it. All right, for our benediction, Christ Community Church, Christ Jesus has come into the world to save us from our sins and to give us peace and eternal life. Let us fight to hold on to the peace that he has won for us. You are dismissed.
still had the guitar on, and I was like, nah, I don't care. What's that? I didn't even put my ears in at the last one. Yeah, I, I took them out. I put them in so I could hear. 